Here are some pretty great movies that manage to keep their bad guy off screen until the final act. Whether they're hiding in plain sight, controlling things from the shadows, or just have better places to be. I'm Gareth here from What Culture, and here are nine movies where the villain isn't seen until the end. Number nine, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, Gellert Grindelwald. The Fantastic Beasts series actually kicked off with a solid movie. I know, who'd have thought it? And introduced what could have been an epic villain. Johnny Depp's Gellert Grindelwald. Unfortunately, he spends the majority of the movie in absentia. Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them focuses on Eddie Redmayne's kooky, quirky, magical zoologist Newt's commander, who gets embroiled in a scheme far larger and deadlier than anything he intended. Stalked by the sinister government director of magical security, Percival Graves, everything comes to a head during a final showdown in the New York subway, where Graves is revealed to be more than meets the eye. It turns out he has been harboring a Grindelwald-shaped face beneath a grim, officious exterior the whole time. Using his power, influence, and firm dissimilarity to one of the greatest dark wizards of all time to manipulate the civilized wizarding world in his favor. This narrative reveal is clearly designed to mimic the progenitor of this series, the Harry Potter movies, and get fans back into the same mode, ready to be plowed with another two, three, four installments. Yeah, probably not. Number eight, Malignant Gabriel. After losing her baby in a moment of sudden and shocking domestic violence in James Wan's Malignant, Madison Mitchell begins to hear voices and experience a series of nightmares with some very real consequences, beginning with the murder of her husband. Whether Madison is suffering from PTSD, experiencing psychic premonitions, or covering up her own string of killings is up in the air for the majority of the film, until a decisive climax in which the villain is revealed to be Gabriel, Madison's conjoined twin who lives in the back of her head, and controls her body while she is unconscious. Yep. Literally hiding in plain sight, the mysterious Gabriel finally shows himself on camera by literally bursting out the back of protagonist Madison's skull in a bonkers twist that shows A, Madeline was hearing voices, and B, they were very, very real. Number seven, Bad Times at the El Royale, Billy Lee. Drew Goddard's Bad Times at the El Royale kind of came out of nowhere in 2018, offering up an all-star cast for a noir thriller quite unlike any other. Riffing on traditional murder mystery films, the MacGuffins are a big bag of cash and an incriminating piece of film. And the action is contained to the El Royale, a hotel resting precariously on the California-Nevada border with hidden corridors and dark secrets aplenty. While Bad Times is rife with near duels and double crosses, allegiances turning on a dime and big name characters getting blown away on a whim, there is only one true villain and he's not a guest. Sadistic Manson-esque cult leader Billy Lee makes his entrance once the action is almost at its conclusion, bringing the established conflict crashing down and setting a new dramatic line. Trying to score a piece of the cash everybody has been fighting for while murdering a few guests in the process, Billy Lee reveals himself to have been tracking a couple of ex-members of his cult. Number six, The Boy, Brahms. Brahms is the star of The Boy, a creepy life-size porcelain doll boy whose parents, the Heelshires, bring in a real-life nanny, Greta Evans, to take care of him. What starts out as a bit of wacky shenanigans soon turns quite dark, with the doll seemingly moving on its own, leaving messages and scaring the bejesus out of everyone. While for the duration of the boy, we are led not only to believe Brahms is a doll, but that the doll is alive, a slightly preposterous twist flips the script and reveals the real Brahms Heelshire, an adult boy who lives in the manor's walls using the doll as his surrogate. The true villain of the piece, Brahms has been terrorizing the household for years, wearing a mask, stalking the halls in secret, and driving his parents to suicide. It's an undeniably interesting twist, but many of us would rather have just suffered the haunted doll. Number five, Smile the Monstrosity. When psychiatrist Rose Cotter witnesses the suicide of one of her patients in her office during last year's Smile, she is sucked into a world of disturbing hallucinations, stalked by an ever-smiling entity appearing as her family and friends. Rose uncovers a seemingly impossible connection behind a string of similar deaths, that the witness of one suicide becomes the perpetrator of the next, always smiling as they die. With limited time before the smiling supernatural entity closes in, Rose must find a way to break the pattern before she becomes the next statistic. Although this entity worms its way into the mind of its victims throughout the movie, controlling what they see and experience, 
it doesn't actually manifest in any distinct physical form until the last scene of the movie. But when it does, oh boy, do we wish it didn't. Credited only as the monstrosity, the being has a ghoulish face, stands several feet taller than the average person, and in its reveal, we finally get to experience what the suicide victims experienced before they died. Number four, The Hateful Eight, Jodie Dormagu. Set in the late 19th century, Quentin Tarantino's The Hateful Eight has a group of strangers descend upon Minnie's haberdashery, essentially a large cabin for a snowed-in night of mystery, murder, and high-speed chat. Among them is Daisy Dormagu, member of the infamous Dormagu gang and captive of the hangman John Ruth, who intends to see her to the gallows. While there are lawmen, bounty hunters, Confederate soldiers, and other members of Dormagu's troop assembled under one roof, trading quips, bullets, and personas, the entire film arguably revolves around the one figure not actually present, Jody Dormagu, brother to Daisy and leader of his namesake gang. Jody hides out of sight in the cellar under the cabin's floor for the duration, waiting some hours for the perfect moment to strike and try to rescue his sister from Ruth's grasp. It's a surprise for the audience as much as the other characters, seeing Channing Bloody Tatum appear at the last minute, turning the whole bloody business inside out. Number three, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, Lord Voldemort. Part of what makes the first Harry Potter flick so damn good is its compelling plot. With a mystery that drives Harry Potter and his friends Ron Weasley and Hermione Granger on a journey to discover the secrets of Hogwarts, the magical community, and Harry's shrouded past. And the dreaded figure at the center of it all, the dark wizard Lord Voldemort. While Voldemort has a habit of tardiness in the Potter movies, his first and perhaps most iconic character moment occurs at the conclusion of Philosopher's Stone. Professor Quirrell strips off his turban during the final confrontation with Harry to reveal Voldemort protruding from the back of his head, having been secretly controlling the professor and quite literally whispering in his ear for the entire film. It's an excellent reveal, a tantalizing glimpse of things to come, and one of the greatest and strangest villain introductions of pretty much any series. What is it with villains popping out the back of other people's heads, eh? Number two, Seven, John Doe. David Fincher's Seven sees detectives David Mills and William Somerset go up against a mysterious killer who butchers his victims to the tune of Christianity's Seven Deadly Sins. With only five in the bag, pride, greed, lust, gluttony, and sloth, when entering the film's final act, the killer reveals himself and delivers the finishing blows, envy, and wrath in unforgettable fashion. Turning himself in at the police station, John Doe leads the detectives to one last crime scene, that of his own murder. Seven kept Kevin Spacey not just off screen, but out of the marketing material and credits to turn his late on appearance as Doe into a real shocker. What he does with Gwyneth Paltrow's head is another thing entirely. Number one, you only live twice, Ernst Stavro Blofeld. While neither the best of Sean Connery's James Bond movies, nor an especially treasured entry in the franchise as a whole, the role Dahl penned You Only Live Twice went where no Bond movie had gone before, to space. Well, that and it revealed the face of series antagonist Ernst Stavro Blofeld for the first time. The film sees Bond get bumped off in the opening credits so he can go deep undercover in Japan. While there, he acclimates to the culture and disguises himself as a native in an attempt to blend in and find out who is responsible for the hijacking of a NASA spacecraft. Turns out it's his arch nemesis Blofeld, leader of international counter-espionage outfit Spectre, hiding in a volcano lair. Who would have thunk it, eh? Legendary precisely for his face being shown so little, Blofeld set the template for the off-screen villain, gaining mystique and notoriety through a string of Connery's Bond films, only glimpsed from behind and usually stroking his signature white cat. And that's our list. No many other movies where the villain isn't seen until the end? Then you let us know all about them in the comments section right down below, and don't forget to like, share, and click on that subscribe button while you're down there. I have been Gareth from WhatCulture.com. Cheers for checking out this villainous list today. Hopefully you'll come back for another one very, very soon, but in the meantime, just be good to yourself. Bye-bye.